Okay. I went a little long this morning with the testimonies, but I sure did enjoy myself. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, the Son, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him, the Son, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he, the Son, is before all things, and by him, the Son, all things consist. The way we would say that today is all things exist, or he holds them in existence. And he, the Son, is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, in the Son, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, Christ's cross, the Son's cross, by Christ, by him, to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, by Christ, I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven. In other words, if you're here today and you're on your way to heaven, it's because of what Christ did on the cross. And for anybody that's in heaven, even if they died before the cross, they're in heaven because of Christ and his cross. Verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled. Well, that's an amazing truth that we were the enemies of God and he brought us back to God. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that's an amazing thing again. When I stand before Christ, I stand before Christ or stand before God the Father, not in the works of John Stuart Hallman, but in his holiness and unblameableness and unreprovableness. Man, that's amazing. Verse 23, And ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So that's twice in this chapter he's told us that the gospel has gone out to the whole world. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Paul rejoices in his sufferings, for that church there, and he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. In other words, Paul realized and, and enjoyed in the fact that though he was persecuted, it was for the cause of Christ. Verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. Who do we preach? Christ. Whom we preach, Christ we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, 
which worketh in me mightily. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, and I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I see three things in this chapter that, that jumped out to me, and they are his prayer, the preeminent Christ, and Christ's preacher. The prayer, the preeminent Christ, and the preacher. In verses 3 to 6, we see a thankful prayer. We, thank, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? <clears throat> he, what is he thankful? To whom is he thankful? He's thankful to God. He, you know, to, for what is he thankful? He's thankful for our hope um, <clears throat> and the fact that the gospel had already been preached in all the world, the Bible says in verse 4 and 5. Now remember, when we're talking about hope, how is hope defined scripturally? Don't, um, it overwhelms me, Kendra, when y'all all talk at the same time and answer those questions like that. Hope, you know, the other day, confession's good for the soul, I texted a funny picture to Charles, in which surprisingly he didn't comment on. I was texting, don't tell him by Miss Janice, but I was texting and doing 80 down the highway. I was telling Bo what to put in the truck because we were going fishing, and I'm glancing at my phone, I'm glancing at the highway, and I'm passing all these slow pokes that are going five miles under the speed limit. I'm doing 10 miles, I'm rolling. I looked up in my rear view, Miss Christy, and there is a state trooper riding my behind. Now, I'm doing 80, 81 miles an hour. Typically, they give you nine or 10. I'm doing 10 or 11. So I was hoping he didn't give me a ticket. I put on my blinker, got out of his way. He went by and he was on his phone too, Kendra. <laughs> but the point is, that's the way we use hope. I was guilty, Fudd. I deserved a citation for distracted driving, but I didn't get one. But that's not a hope in Scripture. A hope in Scripture is an earnest expectation with confidence. So Paul is giving thanks because if my salvation depended upon how I conduct myself, if your salvation depended upon how you conduct yourself, the best of us would burn in hell. That's just the facts of it. But my hope is in Christ, and I have an earnest expectation with confidence, and Paul gives thanks for that. And I love the fact that he brings out twice in the chapter that the gospel had gone out to all the world. There's a lot of good preaching, Christy, about the gospel left Jerusalem, headed west, and when it makes it back to Jerusalem from the west, you know, <clears throat> that uh, Christ will come back. The only problem with that is the gospel left Jerusalem going four different directions, north, south, east, and west, according to the scripture, and it made it into all the world, which really should bring great conviction to every generation because, hey, there's about 1,600, 1,700 people groups that have no preacher, no gospel track, no anything in their mother tongue. So we've kind of dropped the ball, whereas the first generation Christians did not drop the ball. But talking about his prayer. He continues in his prayer. He's already mentioned the Father. He's mentioned Christ. If we look down in verses 7 to 12, he talks about Epaphroditus, or excuse me, Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister, who declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So he's, he's still continuing. He's teaching the, the Trinity here. He prays for their knowledge of God's will. Okay, Denise knew at 7 that God wanted her to be a missionary, and she had a a, I don't know if everybody caught it, but she had a, a an honest and truthful opinion of what we're doing now. We may not be on a foreign field, but we're still on a mission for Christ, even though we're here in Smithville, or in this case, Bethlehem, Mississippi. Okay, Paul prayed for their knowledge of God's will. And we act today, I hear people do it in the most conservative of circles. So I'm not disrespecting anybody, Chris, but we're always, I'm just looking for what God's will is. And we act like, Brother Jerry, that God is hiding his will from us. His will is, it should be very apparent to us. But obviously every generation of people from the time of Christ to today struggles with what God's will is. So Paul is praying for them to grasp God's will. I would like for you to continue to, to pray that for your preacher. I try to pray that for y'all. I have a vision for what I think the church can do. Maybe the church numbers will grow. Maybe we'll just be faithful witnesses. There's really only one who knows that, and that's the Lord. But I have a vision of what things that we could do, and I need y'all to pray for me like Paul prayed for that church, that I will know what God's will is. And with all wisdom, Christ likeness with all understanding how to take Christ likeness and apply it to our world. And then he prays here that they walk worthy. Look here. 
Uh, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of, uh, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge. So he didn't just want you to come to know God. He wants you to continue to grow in God, and that's what he's praying for. And, you know, people want to act like today, Jake, that, Conduct's not important, but over and over in Scripture, the Lord shows us people praying that we not only understand God, but that we walk worthy of God. So in God's program, our conduct is important. He prays that they're fruitful in every good work, which clearly assumes that they'll be witnessing, they'll be, you know, they'll be separated, they'll be giving, they'll be doing all the things that Christians should do. He prays that their knowledge would increase. How do we increase our knowledge of the Lord? Exactly right. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a, a light unto my path. Uh, thy word of, uh, let's see. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I said that already. You know, wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. We don't want to use the Bible as, as, as a whipping post for our children or for ourselves, but it is the Bible that shows us. We talked about this in Sunday school, how, you know, if we want to understand, if we want to recognize error when we see it, we need to understand the truth, you know. Excuse me, I gave an example I got from my father, but it's just I've never forgotten it. The counterfeit specialists with the FBI, Chris, they don't study the counterfeits. You know, there's a lot of people who want to study what the Mormons believe in. They want to study what the Jehovah's Witness believe in. They want to study what this cult believes in, that cult believes in, the other cult believes in. If you just study what the Bible says, when you come across that cult, that false teaching, it'll blare out to you. That's what the counterfeit specialists do. They don't study the counterfeit. They study the legitimate dollar bill, the legitimate $5 bill, the real, you know, m you know proper 10, 20, 150. I forget which one's most uh, copied. I think it might be the $50 bill that's most copied, but whatever it happens to be, they study the real one. So when they see the fake one, it jumps out of us. If we study God's word and somebody says, hey, God chose this person to go to hell, you go... <laughs> And the Bible says right here, he's not one that any should perish. So that's an error. Uh, if we get in the word, and that's what Paul is praying for them. Uh, in verses 13 to 21, we see the preeminent Christ. You know, preeminent means, y'all remember those Jesus first pins from the 80s? Anybody besides me remember those Jesus first pins? Few people. I've actually heard people preach against them, which is just the dumbest thing to me. I mean, you can find a reason to find, make anything wrong, right, Miss Kendra? I mean, and the idea was, Jesus first, he ought to be the only thing, you know? I mean, that's that makes for good preaching, but he should be first in our life, right? The Bible teaches that my love for him should be so great that my love for Denise, and y'all don't want me to get teary-eyed about how much I love Denise, but my love for Christ should be so great that my love for Denise appears hate compared to how well I love him. My, I love my kids. <laughs> I'd give my life for my kids. i give my life regularly for my kids, even though they may not see it at this point. They will when they get old. But my love for them has got to look like hate compared to my love for Christ. I mean, that's he, he's preeminent. He's before all things. He, he, he's first in my life. It says here, in verse 13, he delivered us from the power of darkness. None of us saved ourselves. All of us were born sinners, but Christ delivered us. And he translated us, not from English to Spanish or English to French or whatever, but from sinner to to saint. I couldn't have made myself a saint. Kendra couldn't have made herself a saint, but the preeminent one can. Amen. Hmm. In whom we have redemption. It's in Christ. Uh, <clears throat> through his blood. He's the image of God and we're stamped on, he, we're, he's stamped on us. We're, by him were all things created. I'm not going to read it all to you again. Let me say it this way. He created all things. He continues to make all things get, uh, exist. He is the crowned one. He is the preeminent head of the church. He's the reconciling one. We can't reconcile ourselves to God. We can't redeem ourselves. Christ is the reconciling one and the redeeming one. Christ is everything. He's preeminent. He's everything. Okay? Verse 23 to 29. 
is really talking about Paul the preacher. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, that's so easy for us to do because I know it must be human nature because it's all through Scripture that we're commanded not to look at the circumstances but to look at the Savior. So we, we, when we move away from the Savior, even as believers, it's because we quit looking at Him and what He wanted and began to look at the circumstances or we began to look at what this person thinks and what that person thinks and what the other person thinks. Can't move away from the gospel. Paul warns us that. He tells us again, the gospel's gone into all the world. He rejoices from prison for, thy salva for their salvation. He reiterates that God makes known the gospel to us. Look, I'm, I'm made a minister, a servant of the gospel. Okay, it says, verse 26, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known the riches of the glory of this mystery. Now, people would take verses 26 and 27 and go, oh, God made known the mystery of Christ to his saints, you see. So he chose some people for heaven, and he let other people go to hell. And some people don't have the courage to say that he, let, he chose these people for heaven, but he let those people go to hell. But honestly, if he knew you, if, if he knew you were going to be saved and he wasn't working, if there was no possibility for you to be saved and he let you be born, then wouldn't that be sending you to hell? Yeah, it would. So to say that he chose some people for hell is, as near as I can figure, it's a misunderstanding of Scripture. Because look, look how he closes out the chapter. Verse 27, To whom God would make known the riches of his glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, we preach Christ, warning the saints. Is that what it says? Warning the elect. Is that what it says? Warning the ones he chose to be saved. Is that what it says? No, it says warning every man and teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. If you're breathing, you have the opportunity to be saved if you're not. Amen. He did not choose anybody for hell. If we go to hell, we trample the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that every man has the light of conscience. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2, the light of creation. We can't look at creation. The things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, even as eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They have the light of creation, they have the light of conscience. The majority of the world has the light of the commandments or the scriptures. Nobody goes to hell because of God. If we go to hell, we go to hell because we refuse to call on him too often at the same time I want it, there, there's two extremes to everything right so there's the extreme that God chose those people to go to hell when, when William Carey was was sold out to you know like when Denise surrendered to go to the mission field when William Carey decided God wanted him to go to the mission field lots of preachers told him brother Jerry if God wants to win the heathen he'll win them without you you need not go that's a wrong extreme at the same time, but the other extreme is we make it a sales pitch. And it's almost like we feel like we have failed God if we don't, if we don't convince these people to call on Christ. It's not a sales pitch. We warn them. We warn everybody. We warn every man. But it's not a sales pitch. If I can talk you into calling on Christ, the next guy can talk you out of believing in Christ. It's between you and and the Lord, the Holy Spirit's coming to the world to convince the world of sin, that's ours, righteousness, that's his, the judgment to come. And you're going to stand before a judgment, whether it be the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne. Look who Paul gives the glory to. It's not about John. It's not about Charles. It's not about... It's not about as much as I love and respected my dad. It's not about him as much as I could name scores of other Christians that I love and respect. Look who he gives the credit to. Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in, sure, that God worked in Paul mightily. But it's God that does the work. 
in, in I think it's 1 Corinthians, it says it this way. Paul planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Look, if you're saved this morning and everybody in the room professes to be saved, that has reached the age of accountability, okay? If you're saved this morning, you are a preacher. You may not be a pastor, but a preacher of the gospel, a minister of the gospel, it's just a servant, just a servant. Just giving it out. It's it's every one of our jobs to give out the gospel. And it's not going to depend upon how well Christy presents it or how many scriptures Fudd remembers when he's telling somebody. Sure, the scriptures are important because it's the scripture that convicts them. The Holy Spirit says, yep, that's what the Bible says, that's you. But it's God that gives the increase. That's why I think Michael will give testimony. I never pressured Michael. I talked to him. I'm not ready. Okay, anytime you're ready, I'm here. It's not a sales pitch. It's not, and, and I've heard some great Christians, I mean, sincere, I know they love God, talk about staying up all night and not letting somebody go to bed because they just felt like they had to win them to Christ right now. It's not on me. It is not on me. It's not on you. It's our job to live it and to give it. And it's Christ that's going to bring the increase. Charles farmed for years. And, and he got mad at me once because I wrote him about farming. He told me he bought a, I think he told me he bought a planter and some other things. And, and you know, other people that have told me that Charles gets teary-eyed when he talks about farming. But you could put that seed in the ground, and I think he'll bear me witness that he had very little to do with whether that seed come up or not. It's just the Lord and the seed. That's the same thing with our witnessing. The prayer that we need to pray for each of us is to thank God for the salvation of one another and to pray that we understand what God's will is and that we're fruitful in every good work. We need to realize that Christ is preeminent, and we need to realize it's on every one of us to present the gospel when God opens the opportunity and to live our lives in such a way that when we present the gospel, they go, I've seen that in you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your sweet people here at Bethlehem. I pray that you would continue to grow us spiritually. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to grow us numerically. Lord, we want to see souls saved. We want to see a revival come, not just to our church and our community, but to our country, Lord. And really, if it be thy will, worldwide, Lord, work in us and amongst us. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.